Hey guys, it's me, Carrie, and we are back to reading Dicey Song after a long break. I apologize, it wasn't intentional, it's just life has gotten in the way and I haven't gotten around to reading it, but we are still in chapter two. I don't know what part of chapter two we're in at this point. Um, honestly, these will all be posted in order in my um, persevering story time with Carrie. That's right, story time with Carrie, I think is what we call this playlist so they'll all be in chronological order in terms of the most recent being you know the, the newest videos and if you want to go back to the beginning of Dicey Song obviously just scroll down to see the first video because if I label them by chapters it gets confusing and I don't know we'll figure it out eventually I don't know exactly where I left off because it was in the middle of a chapter so we're just going to start where I'm starting <laughs> Sammy went back to the workbench and began to fiddle with the paintbrush soaking in its can of turpentine. Daisy gave up. Okay, she said, feeling him in the kind of feeling in him the kind of unused energy her frustration was giving her. Tell me about school today. How was it? I already told Graham. So tell me. I wasn't there, remember? It's boring, Sammy said. All right, Daisy said, suit yourself. He watched her work. Why won't you let me help? he asked. He was too little. He wouldn't be sure to do it right, and Dicey wanted some time at least to herself. She wanted the boat to herself, but she couldn't say that yet, so instead she asked him, Do you know fractions yet? No, not until spring. Tell me something, Sammy, Dicey began. He sat down, contented now. If you had an apple and you cut it up, what would be bigger, the half or the quarter? The half, of course, he said. Why? And if you cut the quarter in half, what, you would, what would you have? This he began to think about. An eighth? Dicey nodded. If you cut the half into eighths, how many pieces would you have? You mean if I had half an apple? Dicey nodded. I think four. Why? No reason. I was just wondering. You already understand fractions, Dicey said. Then why doesn't my Beth? Sammy asked. I don't know, Dicey answered. After supper, they did homework. James was usually finished first, but that night he worked as long as Dicey, doodling on a piece of lined paper. He had a report to do on the pilgrims, and he was trying to pick a subject, he told Dicey. He didn't want any help. He had a lot of ideas. It was just a matter of finding the right one. What did he mean, the right one, Dicey asked. James explained that he wanted the one the other kids would enjoy, because they were going to read them out loud in front of the class. He wanted them to like his. Dicey said she thought kids in his special class were all smart. They're okay, James said. Dicey looked up into his narrow, thoughtful face. She could hear Graham and Maybeth working in the kitchen. It sounded like Maybeth was stumbling through the same list of words she'd been reading that afternoon. I thought they were smart, Dicey insisted, like you. He shook his head. Not like me, he said. I thought they might be, but they aren't. They're okay, he repeated. His eyes slid away from hers and back to the boxes he was drawing on his paper. When Graham and Maybeth came into the living room, Dicey asked Graham if she'd ever heard the song the guitarist had played that day. Graham said she hadn't. Dicey hummed the tune and Maybeth hummed it with her. So Dicey taught Maybeth the first verse, which was the only one she could remember. I like it, Maybeth said. Her eyes had little bags under them, and no wonder, Dicey thought, since she spent most of her days bending her face over one book or another, trying to catch up and keep up. They sang the verse together, twice. Maybeth went to the piano to pick out the tune. Dicey made a mental note to find out the rest of the words, if she could see that boy again. There's something about a coat of many colors, she told her family, who were kind of half-lessening the way families do. Joseph coat. Joseph's coat, James said, right, Graham? Graham agreed and told how Joseph's father had given him the coat because he was a favorite, the favorite of 12 sons in Israel. But this was about a man who went to jail, Dicey said. It sounded American. There's got to be a book somewhere where, there's, where somebody's written down these songs, James remarked. I bet there is. Graham cleared her throat. I have a question to ask you all. Maybeth, you too, she called. They waited. I went to see Maybeth's teacher today, Graham began. James caught Dicey's eye. Her music teacher, Mr. Lingerly, Graham said. A pleasant young man. Well, he wouldn't seem young to you. He told me, are you all listening? Sammy? He told me that he thought Maybeth should have lessons. She doesn't need lessons, Dicey said hotly. Take it easy, girl, Graham said. Her eyes were laughing at Dicey. The kind of lessons he was talking about were special lessons. The children were puzzled and she let them sit in their puzzlement for a long minute. Lessons for someone who was talented. Dicey felt a smile begin, and she looked at Maybeth. Maybeth's face hadn't changed, as if she hadn't yet understood that this teacher note was different from all the other ones she had carried home. Piano lessons are what he suggested, Graham said. Can I too, J Sammy said. Graham shook her head at him. Just Maybeth. 
What do we think of that? Terrific, Dicey said. But how can we pay for them, James asked. Do you think I can? My Beth asked Dicey. Do you want to? It would mean even more work, practicing. You have to practice piano, don't you, Graham? Dicey asked. Mr. Lingerly said he would be happy to give Maybeth the lessons once a week after school, and he would drive her home afterwards, Graham announced. He said he would charge $5 a lesson, which isn't unreasonable in my opinion. She sat back then to let them think about that. Maybeth was on the piano bench, her hands clasped tight together, not looking at anyone. He said, Graham added, that in over 10 years of teaching, Maybeth is the most exciting student he has ever had. If, instead of having allowances, I'm earning $7 a week at Millie's and it looks like I'll be able to keep the job, Dicey rushed out the words because she was so glad for Maybeth and because if she rushed them out and committed herself to them, it wouldn't do any good to think about how she was going to buy caulking material and paint if she ever got through the job of scraping the boat. But I want an allowance, Jamie pro Sammy protested. You said Dicey could have throttled him. There'll still be $2 left, Graham told him. She didn't even sound angry. You could each have 50 cents. I wouldn't need any, Maybeth spoke softly. At 50 cents, it would take twice as long to save up, Dicey thought. But then we couldn't give any to you, she told Graham. Let me worry about that, Graham said. Dicey was willing to go along with that. Maybeth, do you want to take piano lessons, Graham asked, even if it means another lot of work for you? Yes, please, Maybeth answered quickly. If it's all right with everybody, if Dicey doesn't mind and Sammy can still have an allowance... That's decided then, Graham decided. You talked to a lawyer to do today, didn't you, Dicey asked. It was a busy day, Graham agreed. Anything else, Dicey asked? Graham shook her head. Dicey guessed that whatever it was that took her to Dicey's school, she wasn't going to say anything about it. James was looking at Dicey curiously, as if he suspected there was something she was thinking about. I have a report due in three weeks, he told Graham. Something on the pilgrims, so Mr. Thomas will have something to show parents at the conferences. What conferences, Graham asked, startled. What parents? You don't have to come in, James assured her. There are conferences when we finish six weeks of school so the teachers can talk about how the kids are doing and the parents can meet the teachers. Lots of classes have special projects due just before then so the parents have something to look at. We're going to make a bulletin board with poems on it, Sammy said. Poems, he repeated without pleasure. We're going to vote, he added with more enthusiasm. Dicey could figure out what he meant, probably vote on the poems to be put up on the bulletin board. I bet you can write poems, all right, she told Sammy. He shrugged. I'd like to write something kids in my class will be interested in, James said. Dicey wasn't sure who he was talking to and what he wanted to be answered. I'd think you'd want to write something you would be interested in, Graham said. I want to play checkers, Sammy announced. James shrugged his shoulders. Graham began setting out checkers on the board. I would, Graham said to James. Yeah, but you, James started to say, then didn't finish. Dicey knew what he was thinking, that Graham wasn't like the other people. She was different, an oddball. A lot of people in town thought she was just plain crazy. Dicey had found that out the first day they arrived in Crisfield, before she had even walked out to her grandmother's farm. It was what Millie had said. But Millie didn't seem to really think that, at least not now, not anymore. James was squirming in his chair. Graham just looked at him, waiting, and didn't say a word. Let's play, Sammy demanded. Dacey thought maybe James and Graham should have this conversation. I'll play with you, Sammy, she said. No, her. She's more fun anyway. He rejected Dicey's offer without a thought. Then I can hear Maybeth read, Dicey said. I already did that, Graham told her, ignoring James. So all Dicey had to do in the time before the little kids went up to bed was sit with Maybeth on the piano bench and sing. That was okay with her. James came over to join in, and she could hear Sammy's voice sometimes, too. That Friday, when the science teacher announced that they would need partners for the next two weeks, which would be laboratory work classifying rocks, Dicey felt a moment of unease. There were 37 kids in the class, so probably one person wouldn't have a partner, and probably that would be her. That was okay. She liked working alone. She was used to it. But she wanted to be sure everyone knew that she didn't care about not having a partner. She stared down at the notebook opened before her on the high table, pretending to read what was in it, to show she wasn't interested in the babbling of voices. When she felt someone standing beside her, she thought probably it was the teacher and didn't look up, as if she was too engrossed to notice. Want to work together? A ringing voice spoke. It was Wilhelmina. Dicey was too surprised to do anything but nod. The big black girl put her notebook and textbook down beside Dicey's. She dropped a half dozen pens and pencils beside it. She hoisted herself up onto the stool beside Dicey. 
I'm Wilhelmina Smiths. Smiths with an S at both ends, she told Dicey. My friends call me Mina. You're Dicey Tillerman. Dicey nodded and stared. She was pleased to have this girl for a partner, but she wondered at the buzzings of conversation around them, and wondered if Mina had felt sorry for her, the new kid, and that was why she chose Dicey. We're the smartest ones in here, Mina said, lowering her voice so that nobody would hear. She smiled at Dicey, and her teeth flashed white, and her round cheeks got rounder. Her skin was smu smooth and milk chocolate brown. Her hands arranging things on the tabletop were large and quick. How do you know that? Dicey asked. I know about me, Mina answered. I've been keeping an eye on you. Don't worry, I won't eat you, she told Dicey, grinning. Dicey looked at the girl and grinned back at her. Did she think that just because Dicey was scrawny and small and she was so large and strong looking that Dicey would be scared of her? I'm not worried, Dicey said. If Mina knew the kind of things Dicey had done all her life, and especially last summer, she wouldn't think Dicey could be scared. The teacher called the class to attention and began to dictate the background information. At the end of the day, Dicey came home to see three boys' shirts lying on the kitchen table. They didn't look new. When Graham and Sammy came in, Dicey asked about them. Where'd you get these? From the attic, Graham said. Dicey drank a glass of cold milk and picked up the top shirt. It was plain white cotton with a collar that buttoned down. I didn't know you had an attic, she remarked. They're for you. I altered them to fit, Graham said. You're too old for t-shirts, and it may be weeks before we see any money from the welfare office. I didn't know you could sew, Dicey said. For her? She unfolded the shirt and touched the material. It had been worn down soft. She could see tucks along the sides where it had been recently stitched. I've got an old treadle machine in my room, Graham said. Aren't you going to try it on? Dicey peeled off her t-shirt and put on the boy's shirt. She buttoned it up until the top button, which she left open. She pulled the sleeves straight and buttoned the wrists. It felt good, cool and cottony, freshly ironed. Graham watched her and nodded her head. Dicey tucked the shirt in at the waist of her cutoffs. Looking down, she saw that her bosom pushed the front of the shirt out a little. She quickly pulled it out again so it would hang loose. Thank you, she said. There was a white shirt and two blue ones. She didn't know what more she was supposed to say, although she felt like there was more to say. She wanted to ask whose shirts these had been. It suits you, Graham said. James agreed when he came in later, much better than the t-shirts he approved. Is that attic? Is the attic that trapdoor upstairs in the ceiling? Graham nodded. What's up there, James asked. Nothing much. James stared at his grandmother, then he decided not to pester her. I got a job, he announced. You what? How did you do that, Dicey demanded. She had never thought of James getting a job. There's a kid in my class. He had a newspaper route for Baltimore and Annapolis papers. He was griping about it, and I said I'd do it. Gets him $12 a month, James said. He looked at Dicey and then at Graham. Neither of them said anything. It's okay, he explained to Graham. I haven't told him yes for sure yet. I said I had to check with my family. James was always the one who did things right, Dicey thought. She wished that he would make some mistakes, just once or twice. He did make mistakes, she knew that, but he always seemed to be the one grown-ups approved of. Sammy came bowling into the room and ran smack into Dicey. She wheeled around, ready to yell at him. His eyes were already angry, she noticed, and his color was high. I rode a mile as fast as I could all the way, he declared. I'm not even tired, so I'll help James. Graham smiled at him and kept herself from laughing. They were all turning away from her, Dicey thought. When this had happened before at Cousin Eunice's house in Bridgeport, it had been bad for the little kids. But here, with Graham on the farm, with a home, it wasn't bad for them. She wasn't sure James was old enough for a job or reliable enough for it in how much he knew about hard work, and carrying newspapers around, even on a bicycle, was hard work. Sammy hadn't been in any fights at school, and that was good, but she didn't understand why he got weepy when he was losing at Checkers or Parcheesi. Maybeth seemed contented and pleased with her first piano lesson. Maybeth didn't seem to mind all the schoolwork. Anyway, nobody was talking to Dicey, so she guessed they were doing all right without her. I'm going out to the barn for a while, if that's okay, she said. Nobody answered her. Maybe they didn't even hear her. She put her glass into the sink and went on out. It was a relief, in a way, not to have all that responsibility. It felt pretty good to be able to do things without worrying about the little kids. And if Sammy was going to be Graham's favorite, and James was going to do everything right, and Maybeth was going to get caught up in school so everybody could be proud of her, and with piano lessons, too, why should Dicey mind? All right, guys, that is the end of Chapter 2. So we finally finished our second chapter of Dicey's song. Ta-da! 
I will be back hopefully soon, not with such a long hiatus for the start of chapter three. I hope you guys are enjoying it so far. Um, comment down below who your favorite character is. I kind of go back and forth depending on where I'm at in the story. So I'm curious to know who your favorite is. But anyway, thanks for watching. Have an awesome rest of your day and I will be soon back soon with more stuff. <laughs> Bye guys.